Welcome to episode 19 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. The topic for today is what is the big deal about crypto? That's right. I know this is a real estate podcast, but this conversation needs to be had. The topic is too hot. There are too many people that are interested in the topic. So we need to have a knowledgeable guest come on and walk us through some of the basics as well as some of the big picture stuff. So in this episode, we are going to discuss what the big deal is about cryptocurrency. We're going to talk about some of the problems that can be solved by the blockchain technology, which is really underlying the cryptocurrency space. We're also going to talk about how to determine where we are in virtually any market cycle. This is one of the main reasons I wanted our guest to come on today, was to talk about the mentality that goes along with market cycles. And this is applicable for cryptocurrency. It's applicable for real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, virtually any market. And one additional thing, I'm going to make a very bold call about a statement Jim Cramer made on CNBC. So make sure to tune in. You're going to really like this one. Now, before we get to the episode, I wanted to make a quick announcement, which I think a lot of you will be happy about. Over the last few months, it has become clear that we are creating a community of like-minded individuals, all pursuing their investment goals, and the podcast has been a benefit to a lot of the listener base. Whether you are a seasoned veteran or this is your first ever podcast on real estate you've ever heard. So because of this, we decided to change the schedule from twice a month to once a week. And I know what you may think about that, which is, oh no, the quality of the guest is going to deteriorate. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have several interviews already booked with some absolute industry titans. We've got Doug Casey coming on to talk about international investments. If you've never heard of him, look him up at internationalman.com. We've got John Azar coming to talk about raising $100 million. So a lot of other interviews with lawyers and CPAs. I mean, it is going to be gangbusters. So if you have not already subscribed in iTunes, make sure to do so. It's the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. And as always, it helps significantly if you leave a review because it allows us to more easily get high profile guests. So thanks again for everyone that supported the show, whether you've emailed me personally or rated us in iTunes or shared with your friends. If you haven't done so yet, make sure to share it with them because we're taking the show to the next level and it's all because of the support that we've gotten so far. All right, let's get straight to the interview. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Carter Thomas from the Coin Mastery YouTube channel. Carter is an investor and marketer focused on the cryptocurrency space. Before diving into crypto, Carter built over 1,600 mobile apps that generated over 19 million downloads, along with launching a blog that drew 5 million organic visitors and taught over 10,000 customers about building a mobile app business. Carter has turned a passion for investing into one of the fastest growing cryptocurrencies online communities, and he has reached over 35,000 YouTube subscribers, which is unbelievable, 200,000 podcast downloads in less than two months, which is just absolutely spectacular. Uh, Just as spectacular, he has seen 200x returns in the crypto markets and has been buying Bitcoin since 2013. So Carter, really interested to get into this topic. It's a new topic for a lot of investors, but um, thanks again for coming on the program. It's my pleasure to be here. Excited to, to chat about crypto. Cool. So before we kind of jump into the the details of this crypto conversation, tell us a little bit more about your background and and what you were doing focusing on before the crypto markets really uh, got your attention. Sure. In 2008, 2009, I was working in a little town called Portland, Maine. For anybody out there who knows, it's it's a great little spot, a lot of great tourism in the summer and nothing to do in the winter. So uh, working at this great startup, but it didn't work out. And so I began my own company building websites, which led me into uh, the mobile apps, which was really hot around 2011, 2012. And I built up that those companies. I had a, had a great time doing it, uh, you know, through thick and thin and ended up selling five of those companies. But in the back of my mind, I was always really interested in investing, right? At the end of the day, I was building those companies to get money to put into some sort of investment vehicle, a machine, so to speak, whether or not I realized it or not. That's that's what I was doing it for. And I think that's true for a lot of entrepreneurs as well. And I'd, I'd always dabbled in investing and been looking at it, but 
it, it never really felt like it was a, a viable business for me because it was such a long-term game, right? It was, you know, automate your, uh, your investments and put it in index funds and let time do the, do the work and compound for 10, 20, 30 years, which, which absolutely works. But as a young fired up entrepreneur, that's typically the last thing you want to hear, even though it is the truth of, of life and investing. And so as I got into the app business and as I continued to move through the app business, I was always searching for something around finance that I could get my, my really sink my teeth into. And starting in 2013 is when this company Coinbase opened, which is a, it's a, it's a cryptocurrency exchange, which essentially means it's like E-Trade, you can just log in and using US dollars, you could buy Bitcoin. And that was the first time I'd ever seen that happening. And so I just, you know, I bought one or two. It was, it was pretty cheap at the time and just kind of forgot about it. And then last year, I was looking at what I was doing with my time and what my business was doing. And I, I was just looking for something new. And I kept coming back to this idea of cryptocurrency. And I kept looking at how big the Forex markets are and how big this trading pool could be and how small this, this business and this idea still was. And so I started to, to buy up more. And once it's, it really started to take off, uh, this spring, that's when I realized that, Hey, this, this may be something that's, that's worth checking out. And, uh, as I started to dive into it, coming from an entrepreneur's mindset, it, it has done nothing short of, of blow my mind in every way possible. And it's been one of the most exciting ventures I've ever done. Awesome. So a lot of the listeners out there probably don't have a lot of exposure to crypto markets, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, et cetera. So in general terms, what is the big deal about cryptocurrencies? The big deal, and I think this is, this is a really important question because I think cryptocurrency is an amazing buzzword and it really doesn't categorize what's so exciting about the whole space in general and what people what's really exciting about cryptocurrency is the technology behind it which is which is called blockchain and loosely speaking it's as if you had a public ledger that allowed all transactions to happen on this public facing ledger but it doesn't have to be just about money. It can be contracts, it can be uh, decisions, it can be identifying or verifications of sorts, but it's this new way to decentralize information. And that's really the, the, the fulcrum of cryptocurrency. The obvious use case that has come out of that has been currencies, you know, specifically Bitcoin, um, but I think that that's the big piece that, uh, many people just haven't re- learned about yet. They think that this is some sort of money dis- disruption when in reality it's a whole set of technology and money is just one use case of that. Interesting. Okay. So the crypto technology, the blockchain technology has the capacity to potentially disrupt a lot of different markets and a lot of different technologies. What are some of the examples of other technologies other than currencies that this blockchain technology can, can kind of facilitate? There's a lot of them. And I think a couple of that are the, the most disruptive or have the potential to be most disruptive are uh, identity is one. So with most recently with Equifax, you realize it's a centralized a system where one person and one set of passwords can open you up to potentially hundreds of millions of people's information. Whereas on a blockchain, it's, it's totally open sourced. And so the information doesn't necessarily need to be public, but uh, the fact that it's there, right? It can be verified that, hey, this is still here, this is still here, and it, it can never be hacked in that sense. So I think things like identity, you know, how we have driver's license or passports, that can all change. I think another thing is the legal industry where the way contracts are written right now, it's, it, it really comes down to interpretation and whether things get enforced. And if you can put that on a blockchain, it can have a logic around it that guarantees certain things are, well, if, the, if this happens, then 
this will be unlocked and you can mm. really take contracts and put them into a completely objective environment. So there's lots of ways that it can be coded into blockchains and it, it's really exciting. Very cool. Um, the altcoin space is something that has taken just the investment community by storm over the last year or so. Um, do you see, well, first of all, what is an altcoin and, and do you see opportunities for long-term investments in these altcoins? Sure. Alt, altcoins can be interpreted a few different ways. Uh, so it's short for alternative coins, which is kind of a way of saying it's not Bitcoin, but they have slowly become synonymous with what I would consider to be stock in a company where you're seeing a lot of companies that are smaller market cap using coins as a way to fundraise and to uh, create tokens that just facilitate the use of that company. Um, from an investor standpoint, altcoins typically are much higher leverage coins. So if you see a 5% swing in Bitcoin, you may see a 25, 30% swing in an altcoin and, and both for the positive and for the negative. So it's been really attractive for a lot of investors because that's where you see a lot of these stories of people that put in a thousand bucks and they make, you know, half a million or whatever it may be, because there's just such a massive uh, potential for those small coins to get to get really caught up in the overall ecosystem of crypto. Got it. And and do you think that buying and holding some of these coins is is a reasonable strategy given the fact that it's really uncertain in terms of who the major players will be in, in three, four, five years? Or what do you do to kind of determine which players will be in the space in that time horizon? I think that on on its own, it's it's going to be really hard as of you know 2017 to be able to to know who's going to be the top of the top in five years. It is it, 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 statistically speaking, I would say 90% of what's out there right now will not exist for a variety of reasons. And so I think the way I look at it and the way uh, I see a lot of successful traders looking at it and investors who are getting into trading is this idea where you may buy a, an altcoin that is the token for something successful. You watch it go up say 25% and then you sell off your initial investment to recoup your your first uh, amount and then you have 25% of free shares or free coins I should say that whether they go up whether they go down you don't really care anymore because you got your initial investment back and that allows you to to play in that market without without having a lot of risk mm -hmm. makes sense um from a big picture perspective what do you kind of utilize to determine where we are in different market cycles? I think that this market cycle is particularly interesting because it's a, it's so, there's so much going on. And also there's so much attention to the space that it's a lot can be learned in other investment vehicles than, than just crypto. So when it comes to macro perspective, uh, what are some of the metrics you look like when I trying to identify where we are in a market? I think, uh, I think first of all, I think you're getting a, a lot of different answers from a lot of different people. So this is just my own perspective. I personally, I see this market and I see it driven so much by, by the human element, by market sentiment, by how people feel one day or another, what news is being circulated on the social networks. And the reason being is because it's a lot of very, new investors and it's all very unregulated market. I think the third piece is that there's not a lot of uh, derivatives and options that often stabilize markets. So, you know, you get huge volatility in it. So I think that from a macro standpoint, I'm always looking at what what's people's overall sentiment in this market? How do people feel about the future of, of cryptocurrency? And the way I'm gauging it personally is I'm looking at it like as if we're on a bubble and let's say we're halfway up the bubble or a third of the way up the bubble where 
you have a lot of early adopters that are slowly becoming quote unquote seasoned or whatever the curve is called, you know, like people that kind of know what they're doing. And then you get all these new people coming in. Uh, and then you're also starting to see some big money coming in. And the big shift that's happening now is that everything's getting bigger, but you're getting more and more people that think we're at, we're just at the beginning. And I don't care what business, I don't care what market it is. It can be real estate. It can be crypto. It can be internet stocks. When you have a huge majority of people who are all putting in money into something and is going what way up, and more importantly, everyone thinks that there's a really long way to go, that's when things start to get a little shaky. And I think right now, we are, we have, we're we have not there yet. I think that there's still a lot of skepticism. There's still a lot of people that think we're at the top. And so what I'm personally looking for, waiting for, and I, I do this by looking at the news, looking at Twitter, just talking to people in general. I'm waiting for people to start being like, okay, wow, you know, this actually might be a real thing. This, this actually does have a long way to go. I'm going to put way more money into this. That's when I'm going to start to count my chickens, so to speak. <laughs> Got it. Um, you mentioned kind of part of those cycle changes is the big money coming in. Is the private equity and hedge fund money, is that in the space already or is that something that's going to be happening in the forefe- foreseeable future? It's, it, it's, it's not really happening in a meaningful way. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest, uh, but a lot of it happens behind the scenes where publicly a private equity company or a venture capital fund or a hedge fund, even, even a bank may say that, you know, this is way too volatile. It's way too early, but then you go out to dinner with them and they tell you a different story about, Hey, we're, we're definitely investigating this. We're looking into this. You know, I, I've, I know personally uh, of some friends who work in the financial sector and they're taking their bonus checks and it's going directly into cryptocurrency because they can't, they can't put any money from the fund in. So there's, there's money going in because they don't want to miss it, but there's also a PR angle to anything, uh, both from a public facing PR, but also to their investors with, especially with the funds. I think that in the next, six to 12 months, you are going to start to see a few things happen. One, you're going to see futures and derivatives markets opening up the ability to short the market, the ability to buy options or futures on Bitcoin. That's going to be very appealing to allow bigger money to come in. The market cap will get to a point where it qualifies as a meaningful asset class for loose example if bitcoin hits a hundred million hundred billion dollar market cap then it becomes something that's that's quasi interesting to something like a pension fund right because they can justify a hundred billion dollar asset class they can't justify a 45 billion dollar asset class so things like that are going to start to happen um but right now a lot of what is what's happening is you're seeing banks, you're seeing equity firms, you're seeing hedge funds. They're saying, hey, you know, look, it's who knows what's going to happen. This is all kind of this. We're, we're, we're dabbling in this, but no one's really saying we're going all in with the exception of guys like uh, what's his name? Mike Novogratz who's coming out and saying like, hey, I'm going I'm putting 500 million bucks in. I'm I'm going all in on this. Uh, I think he's the exception right now. But I do think that the big money is certainly coming. What is the current market cap market cap of cryptocurrency markets? It's uh, right around 150 billion, uh, and about half of that is Bitcoin. So, you know, from there it, it gets really sliced down between Ethereum, like the top ten, and then everything else. So it's it's very heavy on the top top ten account for almost 90 percent of the market cap, but as I, as anyone can imagine, that goes up, up and down five ten percent in a daily basis, which is insane to think about from a from a market you know a capital market standpoint. Um, so for all I know, in in a week it could be, you know, two hundred or a hundred billion, five hundred billion. Who knows? Right. <laughs> so you know, comparatively to other major technologies that have brought about you know, significant changes disrupted multiple different industries. I mean, the internet obviously comes to mind. I mean, how big do you think the crypto market will be in the next five years in terms of market cap size? 
I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be pretty big. I think it'll definitely be in the multiple trillion dollars. Uh, and the reason why I think that is the, the nature of the, the money supply is mostly fixed supply currencies. So Bitcoin is a good example of this. There's only 21 million Bitcoin and there's only so many decimal points that it could be sliced up. So eventually the only way for growth to happen is for the price to go up. Uh, and that assumes obviously all the use cases and how, how people translate the value of storage of value and equate it to gold and, and all that sort of thing. But I think the other big piece that often gets overlooked, which is where I, I tend to focus is how a lot of these new altcoins have real companies behind them. And we may see a billion dollar company come out of nowhere that's backed by cryptocurrency. And instead of getting pulled into, let's let's say the S&P 500, that gets put into the crypto market cap. And so you're going to see a big shift from corporate earnings from traditional how they how they measure traditional markets over to the quote unquote crypto market cap. So that's why I'm very bullish on on that in itself, along with the individuals like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the altcoins. Got it. If the crypto markets are going to become a, a multiple trillion dollar market cap, what does that mean in terms of percentage of people using the the technology? as you know purchasing items or something like that i think that i think that 99 percent of people in the world will never use cryptocurrency uh to purchase anything i think that the idea of hey we're not gonna have cash anymore you're gonna be using some bitcoin wallet or bitcoin app or something Mm -hmm. is not gonna happen i think that that's the, the for, for a variety of reasons. I do think that the technology on the back end of what happens with your credit card may start to use something around a cryptocurrency or a blockchain. So I think that most people will never actually uh, see a cryptocurrency or use a cryptocurrency in a day-to-day use case for the most part. I do think that a lot more people will have it in their portfolio as a hedge the same way a lot many people have five one to ten percent of their portfolio maybe in gold i think you're going to start to see that a lot more and i think that that's going to get rolled into index funds mutual funds pensions and that that indirectly touches you know tens of millions of people through that um but there's only there's only a few currencies that really fit the mold of People own the currency, they interact with the currency, they they care that they have the particular currency. I think most of this will just be on the back end and then you, c- consumers will see a front end interface that they're very used to already. Interesting. Okay, that's definitely something to consider. Um, you know, the Bitcoin market, obviously it's been very volatile, but there's probably nothing like what happened in 2013. So walk us through what took place in 2013 with Bitcoin in particular and you know what has changed since then or what are some of your thoughts on that that situation sure the so leading up to 2013 uh, Bitcoin was I mean if you can imagine way even more speculative than it is now by a, by an order of magnitude and there was really only one main place you could go to buy and sell Bitcoin or exchange Bitcoin for other stuff. And that was called, uh, an exchange called Mt. Gox. And they, they were exchanging a massive percentage of the market cap. And that the, the price was going up. There was a lot of speculation. It was a very, very parabolic curve. And then all of a sudden Mt. Gox was hacked. And there's a lot of theories about what you know, the hack was potentially driving the price up. People were buying fake Bitcoins and funding it. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories. But the bottom line is it was hacked and a, a large amount of Bitcoins were just removed immediately from the market supply and overall sentiment was just killed, right? All credibility, all faith in the system, everything just plummeted. And there was a 90% drop in the value of Bitcoin. It went down to right around $200. And that was... 
almost a fatal blow to the marketplace. And I think the only reason it wasn't a fatal blow is because there were still so many original Bitcoin holders that still had a big money supply that still believed in it and were able to rebuild and recreate uh, essentially a new market. But the difference between that and now is that it was a, there was only one place to go. There was, re- there was absolutely no regulation whatsoever. I mean, it was complete free for all. Um, and people just, it was just funny money. I mean, you were sending money out into the internet to like, there was no verification. You had no idea what was going on. Um, and there, it was just kind of this big, I hope this works out type of situation. Now there's dozens of exchanges, there's governments involved, there's lots of accountability, um, multiple different exchanges, multiple different currencies you can trade against those exchanges. Uh, not to say that there isn't the potential for a big drop to happen again. It's just that there's a lot more in place to come back from that uh, than there was before. Interesting. And and for those of you listening at home that are not familiar with that story, I believe that it, it can't even be put in perspective how Wild West, the Wild West of Bitcoin was back in the days. I, I have heard that Mt. Gox was created originally by people who wanted to create a website to buy and trade Magic the Gathering cards. Is that true? <laughs> I yeah. believe I've heard. Okay. So that'll yeah, kind of was... get a perspective of like the experience level of, of the sophistication behind some of the people involved in that transaction. I mean, it was, it was the most, rid- I mean, and I didn't buy any uh, cryptocurrency before Coinbase. So I, I personally didn't actually buy it, but I remember talking to friends in San Francisco who were buying Bitcoin in 2011, 2012. And I mean, it was the sketchiest stuff you could ever imagine. I mean, you're just, you're sending money or wiring money to somebody in Europe and you have, they're going to send you back a bunch of codes, uh, you know, that you print out that has these private keys that you can then somehow redeem in a wallet somewhere that you got to run command line stuff on your computer. I mean, it was crazy and somehow it's worth money. So for all intents and purposes, it was it, it was completely ridiculous. And it's, it's now looking back, you know, this looks like we are massively sophisticated. So it's always funny to, when I talk to my friends and family who are still obviously skeptical of cryptocurrency and they look at it like it's this crazy world. Uh, to me, I think it's, Hey, it's great. Like I got this hardware wallet and I've got, you know, insurance based exchanges. Like this, this, mm-hmm. this is way better than what it used to be. There's a lot of people that are out there bad mouthing crypto. I mean, I, I saw Jamie Dimon, for example. I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with this. He went on, he took the time out of his day to go on CNBC to make the announcement that Bitcoin is a massive fraud. Why do you think there are so many people that are so motivated and passionate about bashing this technology? I think it's I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different reasons why it could happen. And obviously this is all, all speculation. I think that I always try to imagine what I, I try to put myself in, in the shoes of Jamie diamond and understand where is he coming from? Um, why would he say something like this? Especially when for everybody who says that it's a complete load of whatever, there are other people that say, Hey, you know, this, there might, there might be something to this. Um, but I do think that for the most part, the the overwhelming uh, institutional money is like, hey, you know, this is this is this is nothing. You know, what is this kind of joke? It's going to crash. I think that he is in a position where it's better for him to be wrong first, and then change his mind later and say, hey, look, you know, we adapt to the market. We did the math, and it looks like this is something we got to be a part of. As opposed to if he came out and said, hey, this is this is going to be something and then it wasn't, that would be a lot worse for him, right? It, it's as an investor, as, especially someone who's managing $6 trillion a day in money, it's better to be very pessimistic about something and then change your mind when the data shows you not to be pessimistic than to go the other way. And so I think that's a big piece of it. Uh, I think... The other big piece that uh, is kind of my own conspiracy theory is you see guys like Ray Dalio and Jordan Belfort, who, you know, the wolf of Wall Street, 
they came out relatively soon after Jamie Dimon and said that they were very, very bearish and it was definitely a bubble and all this. And then he realized that they got books coming out and that they saw that this is the most viral thing that can, that they could say. And lo and behold, they have the same book publisher and hmm. you know, like it's so like there's things like that too, where it's a great way to get news exposure is to come out and say that you're a bear because you're going to see this evangelical community of crypto folks just all over you, just sp- putting your name everywhere. Uh, so I think that there's a, there's a little bit of everything involved in that. Um, but for the most part, I think that conservative institutions have to be conservative, right? That's what they do. And Bitcoin is not a conservative, uh, it's not even a conservative thing to talk about, right? You can, you'll just get, it, it represents a lot of, uh, new ideas and also threats to the existing system. So I think that's a big part of it. Man, you touched on a lot of great things there. That's uh, definitely something to think on. I, I remember in that exchange later on CNBC that day, we had Jim Cramer say, oh, <laughs> Jamie Dimon killed Bitcoin. And I think that that's going to go down in, over the next decade. That will be probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen on television. It's it's to be determined at this point, but that, that quote – I, I'm going to say that that'll probably be one of Jim Cramer's worst calls, and that's saying something. So that's that's something I'm going to go on record right now saying. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I saw that too, and I think that the one thing that that has fascinated me, and this is something that I've realized as I get uh, deeper into crypto. And for the record, I am not a hey, you know sell my house, go buy crypto type of person. I, I fully understand that this is a, still a, a risky uh, environment to be in. But one thing that always fascinates me is that when I look back at, say, the last uh, uh, Bitcoin's been around, give or take, for seven years. And there's a great website called, I believe it's Bitcoin Obituaries. And it, it cites every time that the that the media or somebody has declared Bitcoin dead. And there's over 200 separate news articles that talk about how it's dead and how it's never going to come back. And if it hasn't been killed yet, it, it, there's something to that. I mean, it's very difficult for an idea to consistently be talked about and consistently be pushed down by the most powerful people in the industry. And yet it still comes back and some would say it's even thriving right now. So that's the other thing to, to, to wonder is, well, why can't anybody kill it? Totally. Very good question. And, you know, you mentioned some of the most powerful people in the industry. There's also a lot of power people not in the industry, which creates a lot of volatility as well. So let's talk about the government's interaction with these, these currencies for, for a little bit. So first of all, what countries are taking a really hard stance or it appears to be taking a hard stance against some of these currencies or technologies? the the big the countries that have come out with the most aggressive restrictions are uh china's the, the most the, the the best example and what's interesting is that china in as they've done in pretty much all regulatory situations is that they very quickly make a unilateral decision and then slowly fill in the gaps as they figure out what their solution will be, which inevitably is one that will benefit them as a country and as a global superpower. So they came out and they said ICOs, which is initial coin offerings. It's kind of like the crypto version of an IPO. It's just a a different way to fundraise that those are going to be illegal or highly regulated. Exchanges are going to be illegal, highly regulated. They came out and really just blanketed all these regulations. And they have since come back and said, hey, look, you know, we're not going to ban it all, but it's going to be, there's going to be a lot more rules now. So they came out, South Korea did the same thing. The United States is starting to put on the uh, put on the heat around ICOs specifically for good reason. And I think everyone should know that Many people are doing scammy stuff in the ICO space. So regulation, no matter how you feel about it, is the goal of it is to shut down a lot of people that are just getting ripped off. So uh, that's one of the big reasons. I think on the flip side, you see governments, especially in Europe, that are really trying to embrace cryptocurrency. 
So countries like Estonia are doing what's called an e-residency program where you can apply to become a global resident of Estonia on the blockchain using their government technology. Companies like, or countries like Finland, I believe, and Norway are also following suit. You're seeing Japan come out and say, we are going to endorse uh, these 14 exchanges and we're going to make sure that these are regulated, but that we, we do want you to be able to uh, trade and exchange cryptocurrency. And then the United States is kind of in a holding pattern in many ways because what everybody is starting to see, for the most part, I shouldn't say everybody, but the overall sentiment is that people want to regulate it, but more importantly is they want to make sure that they want that they get some of the upside if this turns out to become a a true international currency. Because the worst thing a government can do is make some sort of decision that ends up really hurting them in the economic sphere, right? The, like they want to regulate it, but more importantly, they want to keep as much as they can under their jurisdiction or within their, within their rights. So in the U.S., it may be some sort of tax. In China, it may be not letting Bitcoins leave the country or whatever it may be. But that's what you're starting to see. So I would say the global, the global economy is recognizing it. They're, they're trying to slow it down to a certain extent. And I, I guess you could say they're trying to protect the, cust- the average retail investor to a certain extent. Um, but more importantly is the discussions are how do, we, how do we leverage this to make sure that we don't get left behind if this becomes a real international currency? Yeah, definitely. Um, in doing some research you know, prior to this interview and, and just – you know, for my own interest, there's obviously some similarities between crypto and marijuana, and there's some differences. Talk about some of the similarities and differences from your perspective uh, with the crypto space. Sure. I think that I think that when you look at crypto, as most people do, from a an investor or more importantly, from a profit standpoint, speculator standpoint, it there's a lot of similarities, right? It's there's a huge demand. There is very, very little regulation. Uh, there are seemingly infinite ways to create su- secondary markets or you know new sources of of investment that can just that can blossom the thing into something bigger than maybe the earnings report would tell you it's worth or, or whatever it may be. Um, so I think from a financial standpoint. At least in the United States, there are a lot of similarities of where there's if, – if people are willing to put money into something, there's a lot of ways you can skin that cat and that just grows it. I think that the marijuana industry, however, has people that are willing to – like there's business models behind it, right? There, there's, there's actual money exchanging hands, even if it's cash. That demand is met to a consumer demand. Versus in cryptocurrency, that demand is being met by investor demand. So that's why crypto tends to be a little, uh, I should say, a lot more bubbly. Because where's the, where's the value come from? Well, it comes from a, a projected use case that has, in many ways, has not been fully vetted uh, in a traditional business model standpoint. So I think that that's one big piece to, to think about. There's no hard cash coming in uh, to justify the investment yet. I think that that will change down the road. I think the other big thing is that cannabis is a, a relatively regional and potentially national opportunity, whereas crypto is a completely international opportunity. So the, the sandbox that you're playing in with crypto doesn't have borders nearly as much as cannabis does, both state, federal, and things like that, uh, which opens it up to way more potential for uh, for growth, but also for speculation, for fraud, for things like that. Um, there's no inventory. I mean, it's a block. There's a lot of different ways that people can measure what's really going on in crypto. So it's a little bit more of a gray science. Um, but I think, yeah, from a as an inve- from an investor standpoint, there's just it's it's kind of like investing in cannabis would be really good equivalent to a 
one particular altcoin that has one particular use case. I think that would be a really interesting comparison to make. Mm, got it. Uh, and obviously, you know, both of us are bearish on the technology as a whole. I think it's challenging to find who the major winners will be, but we obviously don't want to be investing in something just because the value will go up. What you were kind of alluding to earlier, how is it, how do you determine where the underlying value is coming with crypto? I mean, you mentioned earlier that you don't think that the majority of people will actually use cryptocurrencies to make purchases, but where are you kind of getting the ideas of of the future earnings, the future valuation increases? How are you pulling accurate data on that? And what is that data based on? Yeah, I think the the it's really important before anybody gets into crypto, assuming that it's an, you're an active investor in crypto, to be honest about what kind of investment strategy you want to do. And I think the two big ways to go into it are, are you a hedge fund or are you a venture capitalist? And if you're a hedge fund, you go into crypto with a sizable amount of money and you scalp trades and you get good information and you know you do all the things that hedge funds would do to make your 40% returns, hopefully a week in crypto at this point. But the other more passive way to do it, which I think a lot of the listeners to this podcast would uh, kind of be more adept to is the venture capital model where you would look at a lot of these coins the same way you would evaluate any company. And if, if anybody's not, uh, has, doesn't have experience in venture capital, that's where you would start. You'd, you'd start to look into how venture capital invests in companies. And the way they do that is, well, what does the team look like? What is the unique advantage of this company? What's the market they're going after? What's their marketing strategy? What's the biggest threats to the company? What's the timeline? What's the product roadmap? All the different things that you would use to evaluate a company that's essentially pre-money at that point. They have no revenue streams coming in. Uh, there's a great article that's a little bit more, uh, it, it provides a lot of detail. Uh, this guy, what's his name? Chris Burn, Burnisk, I think. And I'll send you the link that you can put in the show notes. Sure. The, and he, do, he does a terrific uh, rundown of how you can evaluate companies. But what I would say, especially at this moment in time, is that it's really just, it's hard to know. I think that without a, without a clear path to how you're going to make money, uh, a lot of it is just taking a really good educated guess and making money along the way. But you know, it's it's kind of like being in 1993 and trying to bet on who's going to be the big internet company when nobody has any idea what the internet's going to be or what's going to do. And, you know, maybe there's the company just hasn't even come out yet. Uh, and that's the way I look at it. I, I really try to pick the winners. And then as it increases in value, I, I pull out my initial investment and then just have some free coins that if it goes big, it goes big. But at least I'm I'm de-risking myself. Uh, along the way. Makes sense. If you could leave us with one bit of advice when looking at crypto or other markets in general, uh, what do you suggest investors kind of do to, to start their learning or get involved? Well, I think without, you know, without knowing anybody's risk tolerance or anything like that, I would personally encourage everybody to go buy like $200 worth of Bitcoin. And the reason why is because there was a great article or a great study, I should say, and I can, I can send you a link on this, where a couple of economists went through and they back-tested almost every index fund as if they had taken 1% of that index fund and put it into Bitcoin. And they found that with no real increase in volatility, there was almost a... 15% increase in overall returns. Meaning if the average investor had only added 1% of, of their overall portfolio in Bitcoin, they would see almost no volatility uh, change in their day, in their quarterly reports, but they would probably see a 15 to 20% overall return at the end of the year. So for anybody listening, 
I would encourage them to at least go buy it. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin, um, but to just to just get in the game. And I can promise everyone that as soon as you buy it, it'll probably go down for a couple of days and you'll think that the whole thing's a scam, but <laughs> it will come back. <laughs> um, but it is, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I see is people that uh, are skeptical or not skeptical, but they never take it a step further and just go go buy some. It's it's actually a lot easier than people think, and you don't have to do anything. Just just let it sit there and check it in the air. Awesome. Well, Carter, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks again for coming on. Learned a lot. I know it's a new topic, so really appreciate the content. Oh, it's my pleasure. This has been this has been great. I'm happy to happy to spread the word. Very cool. If you want to let people know how they can get in touch with you, go ahead and let them know your your site and your YouTube channel. Yeah, the best place to go is go to coinmastery.com forward slash invest. And that's going to get you on the newsletter list. There's a lot of uh, really good information that will send you PDFs, spreadsheets, things like that to get people introduced to crypto. And then there'll also be the link within those emails, or you can go to coinmastery.com forward slash YouTube. And that'll take you right there. And yeah, I do uh, videos Monday through Friday. Uh, all about crypto. And I tend to to frame it in a macro uh, investor way. So I think that it'll be helpful for a lot of people listening. Definitely. There's a lot of disinformation, misinformation, uh, poor content out there in the space, but that YouTube channel is a really good source for information. So again, Carter, can't thank you enough. Thanks again. Terrific. Thank you. For all listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you would like to get in touch with Carter, feel free to find him on YouTube at CoinMastery, or you can find him at CoinMastery.com. Now, if you like this episode in particular, feel free to leave a review in iTunes just about this episode or about any other episode that you like. Leaving one review is not enough these days. So if you liked a certain episode, make sure to shoot us an extra review. Also, always happy to hear feedback feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks a lot.